Welcome, thank you for joining me, my name is Bjorn. Today we're going to be looking at um, my improved Blade Singer. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what to call this. I mentioned that uh, my Banshee build, that in case you, uh, you don't have access to uh, the Blood Hunter, and that's not part of the game, and you're looking for more of a, uh, something that exists within the normal game set of rules, this is probably that build for you. To summarize how much damage this build can do, within one round of combat, you're able to, at a maximum, pump out 302 damage, which I don't think is all too bad. I might be undercutting that there. There might be a way to up that. Well, we'll first go ahead and get into the build, and I'll explain, like, a leveling path and all that shit, and then afterwards I'll do some math and show how you can uh, attain 302 damage within one combat round. So let's go ahead and get into it. So, of course, as we can see here, this is what we end off with. The Bladesinger Wizard, level 14, a Samurai Fighter of level 3, and an Assassin Rogue of level 3. Now, because of the multi-classing, this is going to require some uh, stats to have at a certain level here. So for the fighter and the rogue, we are going to require a dexterity of 13. Pretty nice lining up for us. And for the wizard, it is going to be an intelligence of 13. So it's not too crazy of a multi-class to get into. Obviously, for stat priority here, I'd recommend getting your dexterity and your intelligence as high as possible. Some possible dump stats, of course, strength with this build. Con could be another good one, but it's nice to always have high con. Wisdom could be a fun one to have a dump stat, and I'd recommend having a high charisma, though, with this build. As for the race of choice here, as with the uh, the previous Banshee build, the class restriction for the Bladesinger is that it only extends onto elves and half-elves. There's an in-game lore reason for that, and I went over it a little bit with the Banshee, where it, personally it makes sense that the elves would hoard this this archetype to themselves because it gives them a distinct advantage over the other races. However, if you want to play this with a different race, just talk with your DM, see if that if you can't come up with a story reason, and I'm sure any reasonable person would lift it, but... And previously, just with the uh, the Banshee build, of course, we're going to be going with the Half-Elf here. This is a really strong power gaming race. Uh, we gain a plus two to our Charisma, and this we can also increase our Intelligence and Dexterity by one. Very useful. We gain a Dark Vision of up to 60 feet. We gain Fate Ancestry. Very useful. This is also where we gain two Skill Proficiencies. I uh, decided to go with Acrobatics and Stealth here. We're going to be a very high Dex build. And as for the uh, the background, I kind of went with this Courtier kind of thing. It's, it's from my understanding... My simpleton understanding, my layman knowledge, is that uh, they, they work within the court of a, nor a noble or bureaucratic kind of shit. It says everything right here. I'm, I'm just too lazy to read it, honestly. But mainly with this, we gain uh, insight and persuasion. And then, of course, we gain two languages of, of our choice and the court functionary. I kind of like this background. It's pretty neat. I really like the idea that I came from a, a, an elven noble house and I was perhaps a guard. And um, that guard was trained in the arts of blade singing. So it's it's a it would be essentially an extremely... <laughs> elite house of elves or something like that and that could be a very interesting backstory to play up but of course make up your own backstory as another suggestion talk with your dm about the backstory get them involved in it it will make them feel um like a part of it and, and it makes them more invested into your own character now we're going to quickly go over the build so for the wizard uh, obviously we're going to get some new proficiencies at level one i decided to go with arcana investigation we get a whole bunch of shit here uh you know spells and arcane recovery i'm not going to go too much into it at uh second level we we get to choose our arcane tradition this is where we get to choose our blade singing we gain the blade song quickly going over this we uh whenever we activate it it lasts for a minute we gain ac equal out to our intelligence modifier um, for us, it'll be a plus five in the end. Uh, we gain a walking speed of 10. Uh, we have advantage on dexterity acrobatics checks, and we gain a bonus to our constitution saving throws to maintain concentration on a spell equaled out to our intelligence modifier. So, uh, I really like blade singing. This is a really powerful archetype. Of course, uh, we already went over the restriction with the elves only. For the training in war and song, uh, just like with the, the Banshee build, I recommend going with the Rapier. This is a natural uh, D8 finesse weapon, which you can use your Dexterity modifier. If you're looking to use a Longsword, which, you know, could be, like, if you're looking for that stylistic feel, just make sure you speak with your DM about, like, that that you're going to be using this as a finesse weapon. So, because Longswords are naturally strength-based weapons, so just make sure that's clarified and agreed upon. That way, going forward, you don't get screwed. Fourth level, we gain an ASI. I decided to go with Link linguist here, I felt like this character within their previous role had to uh, communicate a lot with maybe different things or this was like a passion of theirs. I still haven't fully written out the backstory for it yet. Of course, 
go with anything that would increase your intelligence here. At 6th level, we gain extra attack. Um, this could be a nice point of jumping off to multi-class into Samurai Fighter or the Assassination Rogue, uh, because now we'll be able to keep up with that action economy. Or we can just go straight up to level 14 with uh, the Blade Singer. 8th level, we gain a new ASI. We gain the Elven Accuracy here. This is a beautiful, beautiful, insane feat. This is going to very much benefit this class. And this is, this is going to be insane. Super advantage being able to hit things. It's it's crazy. A good reason to stick with a half elf or an elf. At 10th level, we gain Song of Defense, a nice, very beneficial thing in which we can reduce uh, incoming damage to us if we uh, use a spell slot. With the most that we're going to get out of this character is a uh, 7th level spell, so that's what? That's 35 damage right there. So, I mean, like, it's it's not bad. Um, we're probably not going to need it too much. There's obviously going to be things that hit us, but this character is going to have an extremely high AC. We'll get into that at the end. As for a final feat, this is the final feat, we only get three feats with this build, so I decided to go with the Prodigy feat here because, well, we can. Uh, this could be a point in which, instead of going with Prodigy, if you're low on Dex or Intelligence, I'd recommend getting those as high as you can. Get two modifier plus five as best as you can. Um, there's other ways to get those up as well. There's like tomes of Dexter Dexterity or whatever, or tomes of Intelligence that permanently increase your uh, your thing in game. They cost a lot of gold. That could be an adventure of its own to go out and find it, but yeah. However, if we do have this option, I would recommend going to the Prodigy feat. I really like it. We gain a new skill, we gain history, I decide to go with the Forgery Kit. Another language uh, fitting still into that linguist uh, side that I'm trying to aim for with this character. And we get to bump something up to an expertise. I decide to go with Arcana here. And at 14th level, we gain the Song of Victory, so we can add our Intelligence modifier to the damage of our melee weapons while the Blade Song is active. This is why we want our Intelligence and Dexterity as high as possible. Uh, not just with increasing our AC, but our, dam our raw damage output is just so high off this character. So that's it for the uh, the Blade Singer. We're just going to quickly go over some spells I'd recommend here. Um, you know, we could take a quick look here. I'd recommend Mage Hand. It's beautiful. Prestidigitation. Green Flame Blade. But the one that you need to take, I would say, for this build is the Shadow Blade. This is an insane spell. Uh, we're going to be able to cast this at a 5d8 thanks to uh, us having 7th level spells. But yeah, so this is, this is a really nice spell and this is how we're going to be outputting so much damage later on. Now, either you You've come off of 6th level or you've bumped up all the way into 4th level with Blade Singer. Um, I would recommend going into Rogue first over the Samurai Fighter, but it doesn't particularly matter with this character. I mean, both give very, very good benefits for what we're looking for. So in first level fighter, we gain some new proficiencies. We gain a new fighting style. This is where we're going to be going with dueling. This is going to increase our uh, damage output with our with our rapier in this case, while we're wielding it in one hand to a, a, a plus two. We also gain second wind at this level. It's only ever going to be a d10 plus three, but that could save our lives, so very useful. At second level, we gain action surge. This is another reason why we took fighter over anything else. Action surge is amazing. And at third level, we get to choose our mar martial archetype, which is the samurai. So with this this we gain a bonus proficiency. I decided to go with a language, Sylvan here, fitting more into my character of being a linguist. I really like that. Of course, you can go with a skill of choice here. However, with this, I already picked out the two skills that it gives you. So maybe if your background decided to go with uh, something else, you'd be able to pick out those skills here now if you'd like. So the main thing that we came in here for, besides the action surge, was uh, the fighting spirit. So with this, we can uh, call upon, you know, spirit or blah, 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 however you want to roleplay this out. Bonus action, we can give ourselves advantage on weapon attack rolls until the end of our current turn. So with this, for example, uh, we use this bonus action at the beginning of our turn, uh, attack with advantage, attack with advantage, action search, attack with advantage, attack with advantage. Very, very, very powerful. The samurai is an insane martial archetype for the fighter and it doesn't and we don't need to invest that many levels into it so that closes off the samurai fighter now we're going to be looking at the assassination rogue of course we at first level gain some expertise i decided to go with stealth and sleight of hand um i wanted this character to be a bit of a kleptomaniac <laughs> I don't know, I, I want a flaw and I haven't played a kleptomaniac before. Obviously, if you are playing a kleptomaniac, try not to steal from your party. If you do, if you really feel that urge to steal from your party, make sure you do it like in a funny manner and that they understand it's a joke, that they'll have a chance to get whatever you stole back. Be careful of that shit. We also gain sneak attack. Um, this is only ever going to equal out for us to a d6. Uh, once we get to the third level, but still, that's that's a fair chunk of damage that we're going to be able to consistently do. 
At second level, we gain uh, the cutting action. This is very useful in its its own right. We can uh, double dash and move, so if we need it to run away, this is amazing. And at third level, we get to choose the roguish archetype. I decided to go with assassin here after much uh, debate with myself. The main thing with this is that we gain the assassinate ability. We have advantage on attack rolls against any creature that hasn't taken its turn yet in combat. Uh, in addition, any hit you score against a creature that is surprised is a critical hit. We can do a crazy amount of damage on a first hit right here with this. I felt like this gave us more bang for our buck here because we are only investing three levels into the rogue here. And we gain a lot with this assassinate ability. We gain the expertise, the sneak attack. It, this is a pretty nice, uh, nice deal for us. As we can see here, this is what we get at the end here. You know, uh, we managed to get our decks and intelligence up as high as we can. These are the two stats that only matter to us. But yeah, besides that, so our AC, as we can tell here, is at a 20. This is thanks to us being able to wear studded leather armor from the Bladesinger and our dexterity being a plus five. Once we start to blade sing, our AC will in fact go up to a 25. And then as a reaction, if we ever need to, we can cast the spell shield, giving us an AC of plus five until the start of our next turn. So our AC will effectively be 30. 30. There's a good chance you're not going to be hit with a 30 AC, so this character has an insane AC. <laughs> the main thing I need to mention here, D&D Beyond seems to have wrong, I'm not sure why. The rapier here, it says a D8 plus 10, that's incorrect, it's actually a D8 plus 12, because we're going to be using the rapier and we, we gain the benefit of our fighting style, and then we also gain the benefit of our blade song, and then we also gain the benefit of our dexterity, so it's actually a 12. And of course with the skills, I really like this uh, set of skills that we have here, it really lends ourselves to being that roguish wizard, you know, we can do a lot of shit with this, a lot of role playing potential, an insane amount of tools that we can use here, and of course an insane amount of languages, I really like this character for that side of her, with just being that insane person that just knows all these like weird fucking languages like Gith is in there, like what the fuck, when do you ever need that? So yeah, enough with that rambling. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get into how we can uh, output 302 damage within one round of combat. So to start, uh, before we enter combat, we're going to need to cast the Shadow Blade as a bonus action. Or we can do this while we're about to enter combat. This is a bit uh, like a conflict. This is a risk if you cast this while you're about to attack because this takes up a bonus action. In order for us to use our Fighting Spirit ability, that also takes a bonus action. So if you feel like you are sneaky enough and if you are stealthy enough and you are going to catch your opponent unaware, then you'll be able to gain advantage on all those hits thanks to your assassin uh, tree. But if not, if you feel like there's going to be a chance in which you know, you're not going to be able to benefit from the assassinate, I would recommend casting this before going into combat, sneaking up, then bonus action, fighting spirit. Assuming that you're not caught, you'll still benefit from the assassinate, but then this way, um, if you are caught, you'll at least have advantage on all those attacks going into the first round of combat. So when we cast this Shadow Blade at 7th level, that's going to be a 5d8. With our sneak attack, that's going to be a 2d6, so that's not too bad off the start and of course with the our modifiers uh, while this is a spell I had to look this up and everywhere that I've looked it says that you can still add your modifiers onto this ability so we are going to be able to do a 5d8 plus 12 with this uh, this spell active we've cast this we're going in uh, we get the assassinate bonus uh, we attack, we get the sneak attack, it's considered a critical hit because we, we weren't caught. Like, then we attack again, then we can action surge, and then we can attack and attack again, all with advantage thanks to our fighting spirit. So what does this look like? So this is our... F <laughs> I'm, no, I'm a scuffed fucking YouTuber. God, that is a disturbing sentence. I've never thought I'd say that. So as we see here with the Shadow Blade, a 5d8, this is our first attack. We get to do an additional 2d6 thanks to our sneak attack. And because it's a critical hit, either you roll all this again or you just multiply it by two. It depends on what your gaming table does. Uh, we just generally multiply it by two because it saves a lot of fucking time. And then once all that is uh, multiplied and everything, then we go ahead and add plus 12 to it. So this really isn't a uh, too bad. Like, we can hit pretty hard with this. The maximum amount of damage that we could deal with it is 116. So that's a pretty decent fucking hit to start. And then we get three more attacks afterwards. So, however, with the next three attacks, we are only going to be getting that 5d8, which is still an insane amount. We get a consistent 5d8. This is why I didn't invest too much into Rogue, because even though, like, the Rogue sneak attack is amazing, we get a more consistent 5d8 with this if we were able to cast it at 7th level. And meanwhile, we can only sneak attack once per turn, so... And it's not only just a 5d8, it's a 5d8 plus 12. And the maximum amount of damage that we can do with that is a 62. And then we can times that by 3 because we're assuming that we're hitting for max damage. This is 
we're rolling really well here. And also, there's also a pretty good chance that you're going to crit again because we are doing three more attacks all with advantage. So there's a good chance that you'll crit. And so after those three hits, we do about 186 damage. So all of a sudden, we go ahead and add that 116 plus the 186, and then we get uh, 302. So yeah, as we can tell, that's that's not a bad amount of damage. I mean, even if you're not doing maximum amount of damage, you're still going to be doing anywhere in the range between, at a minimum, you're going to be at least having a modifier, so 12, 24, 48 damage minimum from that. And then if you rolled all ones on all the dice, if you roll all ones on the dice, it's still going to be like 22 additional damage. You're going to be like at a minimum of like 90 around thereabouts, and then uh, yeah, a maximum of about, you know, 302 that's that's a pretty decent fucking opener for any round of combat. But of course, that isn't where this class ends. With us being a wizard, of course, we gain all these insane spells that we can learn along the way and figure out and benefit the group another way, you know. So yeah, I um, I kind of wanted to keep this quick. I, I just wanted to uh, show the potential of this build, why I love the Blade Singer so much, and what you can do to just to add some quick little classes in that really benefit it and help improve. I felt that the class was missing at later levels. Of course, if you don't want to go with uh, the multi-class, there's really good reason to take uh, the Blade Singer up to level 20 because you gain 9th level spells, right? You gain a 9th level spell at 17th level. So instead of just going with uh, the wizard 14, you can go to wizard uh, 17 there. And then I think that's when you start to get nine level spells. Maybe just dip into the fighter or rogue uh, three levels there. But either way, you know, I really like this that we can gain advantage. Um, we can just stay in the fray of it and we don't need to sneak around and to gain our sneak attack, we can just give ourselves advantage, get that sneak attack. It's 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 a nice combination of uh, features from these classes. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. I hope um, this maybe inspired you to create your own Blade Singer or create something akin to it and just have fun. And um, consider subscribing and liking and commenting because I have to start saying that because like it feels dirty saying it. Got to be honest. But I I do want to I do want to expand. I want to reach a larger audience, and I I really hope that I can someday. But yeah, thank you again. Have a great day.